Good afternoon, uh, and welcome to this event entitled Why Federalism Matters. Note, there is no question mark because this is not a question. It does. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Charles Breton. I am the executive director at the Institute for Research on Public Policy Center of Excellence on the Canadian Federation. I will be your uh, moderator for today's panel. Euh, je serai votre modérateur pour le panel d'aujourd'hui. Euh, J'aimerais euh, souhaiter la bienvenue à tous nos participants qui sont ici avec nous euh, aujourd'hui, en ce vendredi avant l'Action de grâce. Alors, merci à vous. Um, let me start by acknowledging that the land from which I'm talking to you, uh, Jojage, is the unceded traditional territory of the Ganyengehaga. Uh, I recognize that we all work in different places, and, and therefore you work on a different traditional indigenous territory. Alors, veuillez prendre un, un moment pour considérer les, les premiers peuples de la terre où vous vous trouvez. Thank you. Merci. We have an exciting event planned uh, for you. And before we proceed, uh, let me share just a bit of logistical information to optimize your viewing experience. Uh, pour optimiser votre expérience de visionnement, nous vous recommandons de vous déconnecter de votre VPN ou d'utiliser un appareil personnel pour regarder la session lorsque cela est possible. Veuillez noter que nous disposons de la traduction simultanée euh, ainsi que la traduction en temps réel des communications pour cet événement. Ces services sont disponibles à travers la plateforme de web diffusion. Veuillez vous référer au courriel de rappel envoyé par l'école pour accéder à ces options. Please go to the top right corner of your screen and click the chat button and enter your questions. We'll get to the to a Q&A to Q &A towards the end. Even if you don't see your question appear in the chat, don't worry. Uh, it will get to the moderator. Um, okay, so with that done, um, it is my uh, great pleasure again to welcome you to this event. Um, this is the first in a series created through a partnership between uh, the school and the uh, Center of Excellence on the Canadian Federation at the IRPP on contemporary issues in Canadian federalism. Uh, I'll just say a few, word, uh, a few words about us, about my organization, and then move on to our discussion, the, the, the reason you're all here today. Um, for those of you who don't know, the uh, Institute for Research on Public Policy, the IRPP, is a, is a national independent think tank. Uh, this year, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary. Um, the IRPP was created in 1972 with an initial endowment from the federal government and donations from provinces and the private sector. So right from the start, uh, discussions about the Canadian Federation, about federalism, uh, at that time, mostly about national unity, uh, were at the core of IRPP's mission. And so throughout the history, the Institute's history, questions related to Canadian federalism have remained central to, to the work that we do. Uh, le Centre d'excellence sur la Fédération canadienne que je dirige a été créé, lui, en 2019. Uh, C'était donc une progression logique au travail fait à l'IRPP depuis les années 70. Il s'agit en fait d'un centre permanent au sein de l'IRPP qui est dédié spécifiquement à l'étude du fédéralisme au Canada. Ça a été possible, entre autres, parce que Patrimoine canadien et le gouvernement du Canada ont cru en notre mission puis ont contribué une somme supplémentaire à notre fonds de dotation pour créer le centre. Alors voilà. Uh, assez parler de moi. Passons à, à nos invités. Uh, today for this first event, we're, we're laying out the foundations. We're going over the fundamentals of federalism. Later in the series, we'll, we'll delve into uh, the nitty gritty of, of intergovernmental relations, whether on healthcare or the role of municipalities, for instance. But today, that's not necessarily the goal. Today, we stay in, in some ways at a higher level. Um, again, thinking about what federalism is, what it means, and how it evolves in the face of challenges. So we're, we're doing so with two outstanding speakers, each with unique expertise on the matter. Uh, we'll start with a presentation from Jenna Bedner, a, a, profession, a professor of political science at the University of Michigan. Professor Bedner's research focuses on the analysis of institutions and the theoretical underpinnings of the stability of federal states. Uh, she's one of the foremost scholars of federalism, and we're, we're, lucky, we're lucky to have her with us. Um, Nous sommes aussi chanceux d'avoir avec nous Benoît Pelletier. Je suis certain que plusieurs d'entre vous le connaissent. Monsieur Pelletier est professeur de droit à l'Université d'Ottawa. Il a aussi été ministre au sein du gouvernement québécois, entre autres aux affaires intergouvernementales, et l'auteur de plusieurs livres qui touchent au fédéralisme et à la Fédération canadienne. Il a donc à la fois une vue sur le fond de la question et sur la pratique du fédéralisme au pays. So, uh, we'll proceed in the following manner. Jenna will get us started with a discussion of her work on federalism and the characteristics of, of robust federations. 
Benoît ira ensuite d'observation euh, sur le cas canadien, développant un peu plus sur notre expérience à nous avec les principes du fédéralisme. Puis on va passer ensuite à une discussion que je, vais, que je vais modérer sur les enjeux soulevés pendant les présentations et ensuite aux questions que vous aurez pour euh, nos panélistes. So again, it, it is my pleasure um, uh, to introduce our speakers, and especially now, because it's our turn to talk, uh, Professor Bedner. Um, uh, Jenna, uh, over to you. Charles, thank you so much for that invitation, or that in introduction, but also this invitation. I, uh, Before I begin, I actually want to say thank you to all of you Canadians, because it is literally because of Uh, my experiences working as an undergraduate intern in Canada that I became interested in federalism. It was during a period when um, federalism was frankly quite boring in the United States. And, uh, and in, in fact, the first day I started grad school, uh, you know, so here I, I spent some time in Canada, figured out that, that you no know, federalism was very much alive and very much fascinating. So I went off to grad school at Stanford. And I the very first day I remember um, saying, Oh, I'm going to work on federalism. And my, my professor said, Wait, isn't that dead? Uh, and so I it is, uh, it's an honor and a thrill to be with you. And I just am so glad that you are all spending this year uh, in this series together, really engaging with this important question. Um, and so so I'm going to start maybe in an un unusual way uh, uh, by saying um, what might be on some of your minds, although you, you may not feel comfortable saying it out loud. So I'll just say it. Federalism is a pain. It's totally annoying. Right, um, the provinces are mischief makers. Uh, they create headaches, and one of the biggest parts of your jobs is to fix their mistakes. Um, I'm a political scientist, and this view of subnational entities as troublemakers is the overwhelming view of my colleagues. So, for those of you who somewhere inside of you say, yeah, you know, yeah, I, guess, I think I feel a little bit that way, you're in very good company with an awful lot of scholars, including me to a certain extent. Uh, so, a lot of political science and legal scholarship is about how to overcome the problems that federalism creates. Um, but what I want to do today is give you a slightly different view. Um, and, and that is, I want to I take you from this sense of annoyance to first uh, an appreciation for the competition, which you're probably already sensing, competition between the subnational governments and the federal government. But then I want to take you to maybe a new place, which is of collaboration. So we're going to move from annoyance to competition to collaboration. And, and first, let's think, why would we want to make that move? If, if our view of federalism is that it's annoy an annoyance, or as, as some of my um, uh, legal uh, colleagues have, have called it in the United States, it's the, the U.S.'s national neuroses that we just can't get over. Um, if that's the diagnosis, then what the clearest remedy to that is to minimize the autonomy of the subnational units. And uh, if even in the United States, where there isn't uh, as much of a, um, I think, an identification with uh, an overt identification with federalism as being part of our political um, uh, makeup, uh, if there it's cause for some kind of, of, of revolution, just imagine um, in Canada uh, what it might do, right? So if instead you say, like it or not, I have to embrace the autonomy of these subnational governments formally as expressed, you know, in an organized through the provinces, but also I think it's quite interesting to think about the role that regional governments um, and city governments play in this federal system. As soon as we embrace that, Uh, then we have to accept that these different units are going to have differing interests from the whole. And then we open up the likelihood, the certainty, um, that those interests will clash and they're going to compete for supremacy. 
And so most federal constitutions have provisions for legal supremacy of the federal law. Um, the fed feds often can just simply dominate subnational law by invoking their constitutional dominance. Um, uh, whether it's by pointing to convenient constitutional clauses or through uh, other kinds of things like preemption. Um, and, and where that is not available, uh, federal governments increasingly, we're seeing this a lot in the United States, are can use their powers of the purse. That is, they can buy their preferred policy um, generally by putting out the carrot of new money uh, with strings attached, policy strings attached for the subnational government's to take, um, or sometimes by withholding money or that had ordinarily been committed unless new conditions are met. And this is actually a, a, a recent area of, of um, legal um, uh, um, judicial shifts in the United States where there's limits on that. I'm not sure in the Canadian context where you sit with that. But so using money to buy policy is another way that the federal government can really um, impose its will on the subnational governments. Um, and so when the federal government asserts itself, overwhelming subnationals and winning this competition by force, what's lost? What's the downside of that? Um, of course, you know, we, we know everybody has, uh, understands that the first reason anyone trots out for why we might want a federal system is to tailor policy to fit local conditions, local preferences. Um, that's, you know, the oldest and most cited reason for federalism. And so if uh, the, uh, the federal government is suppressing the expression of those interests, that's considered to be a loss. But there's also uh, a loss of learning. So some policies and practices developed at the subnational level turn out to be really good ideas. And it, it, as we're in this world where policies are increasingly complex, where it's hard to see the right thing to do. And here, of course, I'm thinking, uh, I mean, there, there are many examples, but if we just um, jump right to climate change and how we, you know, the, which is the literally exist, existential threat um, that we face, there's no, there is no single path forward, no single policy prescription. And the, um, the way that climate change uh, affects us um, Ha it varies a lot from locality to locality. So we really want to be able to engage um, uh, local decision makers as we wrestle together with this common um, crisis. And so it's it's an opportunity by 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 kind of uh, practicing a little bit of self-constraint and recognizing the significance and importance of the expression of these diverse interests um, at the subnational levels, it's an opportunity for learning. Uh, and, uh, and that learning, that those policy innovations can diffuse horizontally or upward, vertically, uh, um, some of the most interesting um, policy achievements at the national level of the United States were first tried at uh, state levels. So in this way, federalism is like a problem solving mechanism. It's a way of having an entire society learn um, to think about uh, um, what we might do uh, to make good policy. And, uh, and so given that perspective, we want to think about how do we make it work well? Hang on to that thought because I want to add one more, uh, one more wrinkle taking us. So that's from competition to collaboration. So collaboration. What is collaboration? Uh, think about it as an alignment of values and an alignment of action. And is that even possible in a federal system where I've already said that um, kind of by definition we're going to have the emergence of diverse and often competing interests. But I've also just made the case for a big common objective, which is good policymaking. That is for sure at the federal level, there are federal interests um, that are distinct from provincial or, or city interests. But, uh, and so the, 
the ends that you might want to achieve and the means, the policy means for getting there may differ. But there is, you know, at the meta level, um, stepping back, one thing that you all hold in common, which is you as as public servants want to create good policy. That is, you want to make appropriate policy, effective policy that works for the people that you serve. And so hanging on to that thought means acceptance that of some of the goods that federalism can offer, tailoring policy and learning. Uh, and sometimes uh, those goals do align. And you can literally work together uh, with the different capacities that local, provincial, and federal governments have to achieve those common ends. So good policymaking is a collaborative effort. And there's one more collaborative effort uh, that has, uh, you know, unfortunately, the United States really... Um, become a, a major preoccupation of ours, which is uh, the democracies in crisis. And, um, and with democracy in crisis, uh, you know, if we think about what's holding democracy together and, and what's preventing the emergence of an authoritarian um, state, uh, fragmenting power, certainly at the national level, is quite effective, but the last backstop in the United States or in, a, in, in our federal system against authoritarianism is uh, federalism. And, um, you know, if you, if you paid attention to the 2020 elections, um, uh, which were um, so concerning, uh, the real, there were many heroes, um, but I, I, uh, I'd say the real heroes of that election were in a number of states, the state secretaries of state, which is the office that's in charge of administering the elections in each of the states. The state secretaries of state were our heroes standing up and um, first running a very clean, transparent election and then saying the people have spoken and saying it quite firmly, both Democrats and Republicans. So if subnationals are dismissed and diminished, uh, diminished for being nuisances, um, we lose these opportunities for collaboration. So these, these, uh, these upsides or these opportunities that federalism creates rely on kind of paradoxically, the downside of federalism, which is its diversity. Um, that is, diversity is both federalism's greatest challenge and its greatest strength. Um, and because in order um, for the system to work well, you need to have these diverse inputs. Learning can't happen without trying different things, the input of different perspectives, Collaboration is made more effective when each team member, here the federal government and the subnational governments, uh, brings its own strengths to the effort. And democracy can't be preserved if there's no internal pushback, no diversity of, of, um, of argument. So diversity is a benefit of a federal system that has to be preserved. So that takes me to... Uh, kind of the last big point I want to offer, which is thinking about, okay, what holds this whole thing together? Um, some safeguards. So while we're embracing competition, we need to have some way of keeping the action, the, uh, the policies and um, activities of each of these uh, uh, components of the system in check, in bounds, right? And importantly, what counts as in bounds uh, will change over time. The meaning of the Constitution, the way that it limits the government's power over all uh, uh, and its duties to the people, as well as the relationship between the component units of government, the federal government and the subnational governments, um, will need to change over time in, in response to our changing demands. Um, I, I mentioned climate change earlier, right? Uh, but, he, but including our own preferences, what, what we as people want from our government. 
And as our preferences change, so should, in the federalism context, the assignment of power. Uh, uh, so, so there is no optimal constitution, no one, certainly no one size fits all constitution to fit all federal systems, but no one constitution that's going to work for a particular country over time. Um, so it needs to be able to evolve. Uh, so what that means is we're looking for a system of safeguards that's flexible, that allows for this change while still preventing opportunism. That is this exploitation of that flexibility, that discretion for private gain. So that means we need a system that is not fixed or stable, but instead is robust one that is adaptive, but still capable of um, being strong enough to uh, keep um, uh, actions in, uh, uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in the realm of what we consider to be constitutional. So this robust system will Im tolerate, not just tolerate, but embrace uh, some deviations. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to accept it, I know, uh, because that's going to mean in this system there are going to be things, actions taken by some other governments that you don't like. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, and including some differing interpretations of what is constitutional. That is, the Constitution itself is breathing, is evolving, is changing. Um, and that change comes from trying out different meanings of it. Um, but at the same time, if you can imagine the metaphor of a ping pong game, a uh, game of ping pong, and you want to keep the ping pong ball on the table, it doesn't mean that it's always bouncing in the same spot. There's a lot of room for tolerance of diversity, but you want to keep it from falling off the table. So that's what a sa system of safeguards can do. Uh, and I have to say, you know, uh, when we think about safeguards, we traditionally think about them as uh, managing this competition. And so to manage this competition, um, there's no single safeguard that works uh, I, for a, a, long, a, a good period of the 20th century. Legal scholarship, of course, tended to say it's the courts who are the umpires um, because they're uh, the ones we traditionally think of as being the interpreters of the Constitution and therefore what is unconstitutional. But we, uh, as we're trying to keep that ping pong ball on the table, we can think of some other kinds of safeguards. That is, those that first constrain uh, the governments from um, taking actions that are out of bounds. Uh, so by fragmenting authority at the national level, which most uh, federal uh, systems do, um, uh, uh, that's a way of first uh, it, um, building in checks uh, on overt exercise of authority that um, uh, given the advantages that the federal government has over the subnational governments, um, it's just kind of like an internal check. Uh, second, it offer, uh, offers opportunities for subnational input, depending on how the institutions are constructed. Um, the, uh, uh, the party system, is a way of uh, creating dialogue um, and some checks uh, between the levels of government. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, the people, the people themselves, interpret the Constitution. And though they actually, it's can it, you all, Canadians, are, are much more likely, I think, than Americans to be able to express opinions that are well considered about constitutionality. Um, unless you're talking about maybe the Second Amendment, Americans aren't really uh, very good, the Second Amendment being the one about um, uh, regulation of firearms and possession of firearms. Other than that, I really uh, haven't had too many conversations with the general public um, that are constitutional. Um, but you um, are in a position uh, that is we, the public, the voting public, are in a position to be able to um, regulate our, uh, our government's actions and try to keep that ping pong ball on the table. So these safeguards, no single one is sufficient, um, but they reinforce and complement one another. Now, um, 
and I'll just close with this, that's really about regulating competition. When we're talking about collaboration and taking advantage of these opportunities for these um, different levels of government to work together, that's a different kind of idea. And, and safeguards, um, safeguard might not even be the right term for this, but it's an extension of the safeguards argument to think about ways of channeling that competition into aligned action. Uh, and so this is something I have to say the United States does terribly, absolutely terribly. Uh, we don't really, we don't have an official institution um, that is designed to uh, foster dialogue between the states and the federal government. It's all reactive. There are some uh, non-governmental you know interest groups like the national governors association or the national conference of state legislatures that essentially are lobbying organizations um, but there's nothing that is constructed by the government we used to have something called the advisory committee on intergovernmental relations but that was defunded by congress remember i said in the 1990s federalism was considered dead in the United States. And that's when Congress decided that was just a waste of money because who really needed to think about what the states were doing. Um, there is though, uh, it's fun that we're talking about this this week, one new institution um, recognizing uh, the competition of the states in the creation of American foreign policy. So a couple of weeks ago, um, I published a paper with um, um, Tino Cuellar, who's um, at, uh, at the president of the Carnegie Endowment. And one of our arguments, uh, it was called the fractured superpower. Mm -hmm. And one of our arguments was that, um, you know, you, you have to take uh, seriously the extent that states and cities are engaged in their own um, international relations. And just on Monday, the uh, Department of State announced that they had created a new office, um, first ever, the Special Representative for Subnational Diplomacy. And uh, they brought in um, to head it somebody who had been in charge of international affairs for the city of Los Angeles. So uh, that's, you know, God, in some ways, I think the, the first step forward that I have seen in the United States um, on collaborative institutions, uh, Canadians are far ahead of us on this, and, and I am jealous of the institutions that you have to um, create formal um, opportunities for collaborative dialogue. So just to recap, uh, I have tried to suggest as annoying as federalism may seem at times, um, first, it's a reality, it's a part of our political identity. Um, and so managing the competition that results from that um, is, is possible, but we may even be able to move to a point where we find opportunities to transform competition into collaboration in the creation of policy that is effective and appropriate. So thanks. Thank you, uh, uh, Jenna. I, I noted uh, when you said that um, federalism is a problem solving mechanism, because I think mm -hmm. that was one of the reasons why we ended up at a feder with federalism in this country. But I think that we tend to kind of lose track nowadays of, of that aspect of it as a problem solving mechanism. Um, and, and we'll get back to that when we go to the question. Um, alors, nous allons maintenant nous tourner vers, vers M. Pelletier, Benoît Pelletier, pour mettre tout ça dans le, dans le contexte canadien, même si Jenna a, a, avait quand même des, des, des choses à dire sur le Canada, avec votre connaissance du pays. M. Pelletier, je vous, je vous passe la parole, ce sera à vous maintenant. Merci, Charles. Euh, merci, Jenna, pour euh, votre présentation. Uh, thank you for having invited me to this uh, conference, and thank you for being here virtually, of course but uh, you're, you're here and that's the most important. Uh, thank you to the organizers for this uh, experience of uh, discussing federalism and discussing the foundations of federalism. Uh, je vais parler en anglais et en français. Uh, on m'a dit qu'il y avait de la traduction simultanée, alors par conséquent, Euh, je vais vous demander d'y avoir recours si vous euh, le jugez nécessaire. 
I will be speaking in both languages, not in the same sentence, uh, of course, but I will be speaking in both languages. Uh, I will be pleased to answer your questions in the official language of your choice. I would like, uh, though, to forgive my accent. I have the typical accent of someone coming from Quebec City. Um, and um, uh, but I will be pleased to answer your questions in the, in the language, the official language of your choice. Uh, this being said, um, I uh, will give you my perspective about uh, Canadian federalism. And through my perspective, there will be the Quebec perspective because I've been part of uh, Quebec's politics during uh, 10 years. I was a minister in the Quebec government for six years. I'll come back to that experience in a few minutes, but I'll give you my uh, own thought about what are the foundations of federalism. First, in order to understand what federalism is about, we should start from the, the concept of a state. And I here I, I use that concept as meaning a country, of course, I'm not talking about the different states that compose the United States. Uh, I'm talking, uh, uh, when I use the word state here, it's uh, as the meaning of country. In constitutional law, we consider that a state has and is a full sovereignty that expresses itself internally and externally. What I mean here is this. Le concept d'État en droit constitutionnel, c'est un concept que nous décrivons comme étant une souveraineté totale qui s'exprime sur le plan interne, c'est-à-dire à, à l'intérieur de l'État, et sur le plan externe, c'est-à-dire sur la scène internationale. Of course, this sovereignty is exercised by institutions and we believe in our country, in a country like Canada, and it's the same thing in the United States, that the sovereignty belongs to the people and that the people detains the sovereignty of the state. But at first, we consider that the state, it's a concept that is about sovereignty and not just sovereignty, a full sovereignty. Federalism is a sharing of the state's sovereignty between one or uh, between two or more levels of government, between at least two levels of government or two orders of government. So federalism is about, I repeat, sharing the sovereignty of the state between different political entities there are the federal authorities, and there are what Jenna called the subnational governments, what we uh, also could call uh, uh, um, federated states. I'm not using the word federal state. The federal state is something else. It's the whole country. I'm talking about federated states or what we call in Canada the provinces. So uh, there's that sharing of sovereignty in a sense that we could say that within Canada, the Canadian provinces are sovereign, but they are sovereign in their field of jurisdiction. Their sovereignty is limited and is limited by the constitution. It's the constitution that in fact, in fact distributes the legislative powers between the federal order of government, government and the provinces. But, but the provinces are sovereign in Canada. Again, they have a partial sovereignty or a limited sovereignty. And the federal order of government is also sovereign, but it's a partial sovereignty. Again, it's sovereign in its field of jurisdiction. And the full sovereignty of the country is made by the addition of the sovereignty of the provinces and the sovereignty of the federal order of government. Ce que je veux dire, c'est que la souveraineté complète de l'État comme un État fédéral, comme l'est le Canada, 
la souveraineté complète de l'État réside dans l'addition des compétences provinciales et des compétences fédérales. So, because the federal principle, uh, in fact, implies the sovereignty of the provinces, everything that goes against that sovereignty, like the federal spending power, for example, when it is used in provincial fields of jurisdiction, is something that could be seen as being suspect with regards to the federal principle. Uh, Jenna talked uh, before about the, the powers of the purse. Uh, that's the uh, spending power. The, the, I think it's the power of uh, using money in order to interfere. And here I'm talking about the federal spending power, the power of using money to interfere into, into provincial uh, fields of jurisdiction. And this is something that should be seen as being suspect with regards to the federal principle. When we talk about the federal supremacy or the federal preponderance or the federal, uh, the, the, the federal superiority in, in a state, uh, it exists. But it's not something that uh, is entirely compatible with federalism or the federal principle as it is theoretically seen, as it is theoretically described, as I described it a few minutes ago. So in this regard, you, may, you must understand that some of the positions of the government of Quebec in Canada, and it's the same thing for other provinces in Canada, I say some of the positions of the Quebec government are aimed at ensuring that the federal principle be more respected in Canada. And I used to say, and I could repeat this today, that Quebecers are among the, the best federalists in Canada. It may surprise, surprise you, but in fact, Quebecers defend the federal, the federal principle they defend the autonomy of Quebec. They even defend the sovereignty of Quebec. But here again, it's a limited sovereignty within Canada, as I said before. But Quebec is protecting and defending and promoting the respect of the federal principle in many, many of the positions that it takes at the Canadian level. But it should also be understood that uh, Quebec is not just a, a, um, a province. Uh, Quebec is also defined by the House of Commons and defines itself as a nation. So there is a nation within the nation. And it's the same thing that Alberta tries to do uh, those days with, uh, uh, I would say, the expression of a new nationalism. Uh, Alberta tries to define itself as being a nation within the nation. So I uh, uh, hear you saying, well, uh, is it possible that a nation exists within another nation? Well, yes, what about the First Nations? What about the Aboriginals, but the indigenous, the indigenous people, as we now uh, call them? Uh, what about the indigenous people? They form nations within Canada. They form nations within the nation. Canada is a nation, that's for sure. But uh, indigenous people also are described in the Canadian constitution as people, and Quebec has been recognized, the Quebecois have been recognized as a nation by the House of Commons of Canada. Alors, le Canada, en réalité, on doit l'envisager de plus en plus comme un État multinational, c'est-à-dire comme un État composé de plusieurs nations. Et je peux vous dire que beaucoup de Canadiens voient le Canada 
non pas comme un État, non pas seulement comme un État mononational, mais voit le Canada comme un État unitaire. One of the problems in Canada is that many Canadians see Canada as a unitary state. Uh, what I mean here is that they see Canada as being composed almost exclusively by the federal government and the Parliament of Canada, and, and they are in favor of more centralization of powers in the country. They are in favor of uh, the uh, preponderance of uh, federal uh, powers over the provinces. Some Canadians even ignore the existence of the provinces. When I, when I teach constitutional law and I, I, I talk about Canada, most of my students at the beginning, they only think about uh, Justin Trudeau and his government. They forget the provinces completely. They forget that the provinces are part of the Canadian experience, and not just that. They are part of the definition of Canada as a federal state. So one of the problems that we are facing as a country is that many Canadians tend to see Canada as a unitary state when, in fact, Canada is a federal state. And what is ironic is that many Quebecers defend the federal principle within Canada, and they are seen as being too autonomous by other Canadians. So we are facing different dynamics in Canada that do not necessarily exist uh, in, uh, in the United States, uh, of course. And I will uh, close my remarks, uh, Charles, uh, if you don't mind, by saying this, by saying that uh, Jenna was, was absolutely right when she emphasized diversity as being one of the strengths uh, of, uh, of a federal state. Diversity is at the basis of a federal state. If a federal state is a federal state and not a unitary state, that's because it initially wants to promote its intrinsic, its intrinsic diversity. So that diversity should not be ignored. It should be respected. It should be promoted. And in the case of Canadian federalism, if you ask yourself, what was the main reason for the creation of a federation in Canada in 1867? Well, I will tell you that one of the main reasons was Quebec, could you imagine? Quebec was one of the main reasons why the fathers of the Canadian Federation chose federalism in 1867 instead of, unit, of the unitary model. And I will end by quoting the Supreme Court of Canada in a decision that it rendered in 1998. And the decision, the decision goes like this. I quote, federalism was a legal response to the underlying political and cultural realities that existed at Confederation and continue to exist today. The social and demographic reality of Quebec explains the existence of the province of Quebec as a political unit and indeed was one of the essential reasons for establishing a federal structure for the Canadian nation in 1867, unquote. So what it means is this. It means that Quebec specificity is not something that is, not something that is incompatible with federalism. It's something that explains Canadian federalism fully. And that explains why in 1867, we chose the federal model instead of the unitary model. Thank you. Merci, uh, merci, Benoit. Um, so I, so you, ended, you ended by talking about, again, and those are terms also that Jenna used, 
um, embracing diversity, embracing autonomy. I want to talk a bit about the flip side of that. Uh, and Jenna, you talk, you touched a bit on, on the safeguard and the systems of safeguards. Again, keeping in mind, and to me, I was reading those as safeguards to ensure that we embrace autonomy, that we embrace diversity. But again, the flip side is how does how do we keep a federation going to keep how do we keep keep it robust and stable when embracing that diversity and embracing that, uh, that that autonomy has the potential to just have the whole thing explode right so the, the so the flip side of that is how can a, a, a federation be robust and stable while embracing that you talk about safeguards again but like i'm safeguards against that and perhaps um in a way uh in your view, uh, what explains the durability of Canadian federalism specifically in regards to that? Ah, all right. Well, you're really asking me to go out on a limb as an American to explain why Canadian federalism is uh, in your view. Been... <laughs> but, but let me let me just start by um, you know speaking semantically about what robustness is and is not. Uh, so robustness. Um, is not something that is uh, guaranteed to be successful. Uh, and in fact, you know, for, for those of us who are engaged in um, robustness science, we are always aware of the, uh, this kind of relationship between robustness and stability, that it's all robust systems are also fragile. And it's a question of um, how do you how do you manage that fragility? And so uh, in, in uh, any federal context, what that's going to mean is that you can never take anything for granted, uh, that any government requires work. And, uh, you know, we haven't, we haven't gotten that much into it, but the, uh, at the end of the day, all these institutions that I've described and this, the, you know, the law that Ben Juan I've been talking about um, are only as strong as the public that's behind it. Uh, and it's it, because it relies on legitimacy and it relies on the internalization and expression of norms, norms of democracy and norms of uh, valuing federalism, including valuing diversity. And I will say here uh, that on the U.S. side, we have a real handicap in kind of our cultural identity uh, because our cultural identity has been very much a culture of a maverick, of a self-reliant cowboy, um, of the resistor, uh, you know, we, the revolution against Britain, right? Uh, and what this means, I, I think, in this context of... Um, Need, where federalism depends so much on norms of embracing diversity is that that uh, that maverick or cowboy view is ultimately um, harmful, as we find increasingly in the United States that we need to lean on these norms of uh, collectivist norms, uh, norms of, that are pro-social and, and caring for one another, and in this enterprise that we can build together. And so, and here's where I'm going out on a limb and, you know, bear with me, I'm, um, because my, my, there was a time when I really wanted to move to Canada, I would still entertain uh, invitations, adoring Canada as I am, but I'm an outsider. But I think Canada may have some uh, advantage, as I perceived it as an outsider, um, of tolerating difference much better than uh, in the United States, of, of having some kind of um, it's nearly universally held view that uh, we don't expect everybody to become identical with one another, um, that, and that Canada is strong. Actually, you know, as Ben Wassel beautifully pointed out, Canada exists as it is today because of those differences, and it is strong because of these differences. But that's also very fragile. Um, and and so, uh, so while it's robust, it has this fragility that requires constant, continuous work to maintain. And, and, and that's, that's interesting. And, and 
continuous work and, and this capacity to adapt. Uh, uh, Benoît Jenner parle beaucoup de cette nécessité-là pour les fédérations de pouvoir s'adapter, de, de ne pas être rigide. Pour vous, quels sont les éléments euh, qui permettent à la Fédération canadienne de s'adapter, ces éléments-là qui lui permettent de ne pas être rigide? Ou peut-être qu'au contraire, vous pensez qu'elle elle, qu elle, qu elle est trop rigide, mais il y a sûrement des, il y a, il y a des éléments dans les institutions de la Fédération canadienne qui lui permettent de s'adapter, n'est-ce pas? Oui. Euh, la question m'est adressée, Charles? Oui, tout à fait. Oui, merci. Alors, d'abord, je dois dire que euh, Jenna a, a tout à fait raison de parler de, de robustesse euh, du régime fédéral. I like very much that concept of robust uh, federalism. Um, uh, to me, a robust federalism is a flexible federalism. And it is robust because it is flexible. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we, I think that Jenna and I share the same point of view on this, uh, on this question. Um, uh, what I mean here is this. I mean that uh, federalism should be able to uh, adapt itself to the different socio-demographic and socio-political contexts that exists within it. Uh, and, um, and, and, and as for example, Canada should see uh, Quebec's specificity as being, as being a, an asset, as being something that is uh, beneficial for the country, not as being something that is an obstacle to Canada's unity. Uh, my fear is that there are not enough Can Canadians who believe that Quebec specificity is such, is such an asset for the country. I think that many people think that Quebec specificity is good only in Quebec, and that it, should, it, it could express itself, but on Quebec's territory only. When in fact, I believe that uh, Canada as a whole should promote uh, Quebec specificity more and more. And when I was in politics, I uh, promoted the federalism asymmetric. The federalism asymmetric, uh, ce n'est pas un federalism asymmetric à tout cran. Ce n'est pas un federalism asymmetric à tous azimuts, mais c'est un federalism qui réussit à s'adapter aux différents besoins des, des provinces canadiennes, euh, tout en gardant évidemment des valeurs communes, tout en gardant des richesses euh, communes, tout en gardant euh, un pouvoir euh, fédéral euh, qui, est, qui soit substantiel et qui soit fort. So, this concept of asymmetrical federalism is something that, uh, in fact, some federalists uh, did not adhere to. Some federalists uh, opposed that concept of asymmetrical federalism that I uh, promoted when I was in politics. But in my view, the future of Canada uh, resides in, in such a concept. Uh, what I mean here is that uh, Canada should be more flexible than it is currently. It's not flexi flexible enough, in my view, but Flexibility is certainly one of the values of federalism that, that should be promoted and cherished. Mm -hmm. So if I if I understood correctly, what, what you meant, what, what you were saying is that for you, the main one of the main tools that Canada has to be robust and to and, and to be flexible uh, is would probably be the possibility of asymmetrical federalism the way you understand it, right? Is that, is that what you would say? That that's probably one of the best tools it has to, to recognize some of the specificities for Quebec, but for other provinces as well? Yes, and it goes through uh, administrative agreements or intergovernmental agreements, uh, for example. Uh, there could be and there should be agreements between the federal uh, government and uh, the provinces or some of the provinces or one of the provinces uh, in order to respond to the special needs of the province. But again, it's not a symmetrical federalism uh, at uh, all cost. Uh, it's a symmetrical federalism at as long as Canada 
continues to be a federalist, a federal state. At some point, asymmetry is something that, uh, in fact, uh, goes against the principle of federalism. Mm -hmm. Too much asymmetry is not good for federalism. Uh, as uh, as much as uh, too much centralization is not good for federalism. So I, I promote a limited form of asymmetrical federalism, yes. Um, so I wanna go back to, so Jenna, you mentioned climate change and, and I wanna talk about like perhaps new challenges that are different from perhaps the historical ones that both, whether the US or Canada have had with federalism. And I wonder about climate change in the sense that is that, is climate change a new type of federalism? Like climate change is, is new in a way, but as a type of problem that federation federations need to um, uh, uh, to, 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 deal, to deal with, uh, is, is, is that one new, like a new type of challenge that, that federation have to deal with? Or is there any other kind of new challenges that are really proper to this era we're in, uh, that are the product of the era we're in, that federations are, are, are dealing with or need to contend with? Uh, this is a super rich question. And, um, but I, I actually wanted to say one more thing about, yeah, yeah, just yeah, yeah. about what Benoit was just saying, uh, because, uh, so, so Charles, I'm going to get back to your question. No, perfect. Yes. But I may, I may misremember part of it. So, uh, uh, um, uh, hold on, I'm just making a note to myself. Oh, I can um, I can repeat myself too. I'm, okay, I'm <laughs> but but just thinking about asymmetrical federalism because it's not something that we uh, like a legally asymmetric federation, meaning that there are are different um, legal arrangements and um, uh, rights and responsibilities from one province to another, and and so if I were to take this to the typical American they would think that was crazy uh, because we don't have that. Uh, but it, it, we do have it de in a de facto sense. So when I was when I was talking about the power of the purse or you know the, the use of the spending powers, um, there are some states that are much better insulated. Uh, than others, you know, like California for sure, right? A massive economy. Um, it is not as dependent on the federal government. And in fact, the federal government is much more dependent on, on cash flows from uh, the people of California to it to be redistributed out. And so it puts it in a pretty privileged position. And so we, I think we might argue that in the United States, we have de facto asymmetric federalism. And if that's the case, maybe that's not very fair. And one would want to address it through some legal uh, acknowledgement um, in, in the way that, that Benoit was proposing. So I, I think that I, that's super interesting. And it may be a way of making the whole system more just, even though one's initial reaction to it might be, wait, that means you're going to privilege one province over another. But instead, it may be some way of making it um, uh, behave in a more equitable way. So I just wanted to, to uh, uh, say thank you uh, to Benoit for that, because it's, it's got me thinking about the U.S. Federal, uh, Federation a little bit differently. Now, back to this question, um, is climate change a different kind of problem uh, for polities and for federal systems in particular? And, and I think that you also asked, is there anything else that is like this? Um, well, I would say, first, is there anything else like this? In the U.S. context, we are really in the midst of a massive reckoning uh, over our racist past. And that racist past is very much linked to federalism. And uh, because even as some states were moving forward uh, toward equity, um, a hundred years before others, uh, and and then finally with the U.S. Congress um, taking uh, a firm stance uh, um, uh, against um, discriminatory practices in some of the southern states, it just you know it took a pretty heavy hand um, of denying autonomy to some states um, in order to make that correction. And a legacy of that, frankly, has been uh, that the progressives 
in the United States have abandoned federalism for them. Remember, I opened with federalism is annoying. Well, they would they have they would have much juicier words uh, to describe how they feel about federalism. And so for them, anything happening at the state level was had the possibility of going off the rails into in a racist direction. And so they um, have always practiced a strategy of wanting to centralize things. Um, so uh, um, that's a more complicated conversation, but one that I, I thought I'd put out there. Um, as far as climate change goes, you know, as I said, with, with climate change, our, um, our thought is, well, this is, this is a global problem. And so we need to take this, the solution making to it to the highest level possible, right? The, uh, um, it, and that's, a, that's a, um, not just a, an intuitive um, reaction, but it's, it's probably approximately the right one. But the question is, do you want to leave behind the local and some, you know, state or provincial governments as you move in this, that is, do we want just centralization or do we want collaboration? And I think that this is a perfect example of when we need collaboration because climate change, you, you could walk me through the effects in Canada, but I, I can take you around the map in the United States. And, you know, starting with just earlier this, this week with the hurricane in Florida and the droughts in the West and the forest fires and, um, you know, the general decline in water availability in the West, but then in the East, water abundance, catastrophic water abundance um, with flooding and erosion, et cetera. Um, this is all connected to climate change, but it's playing out very differently. The only way we're going to build the political will to addressing, to making the change that we need to make nationally is by embracing the realities on the ground, having people say, this right here is the problem that we need to work on, and then helping everybody see just how linked that is. But so I see this as a perfect opportunity to promote a collaborative process uh, over a competitive one. And in a way, uh, what you're saying is that, yes, we need a national approach, but a national approach doesn't need to be a federal one coming from the federal government. I see you both noting, which I guess means I'm right. Um, <laughs> Benoît, de votre côté, est-ce que vous voyez, vous, um, des, uh, des, des défis pour la Fédération canadienne qui sont peut-être différents uh, uh, de ceux auxquels on a été habitué par, par le passé, ou c'est plutôt les mêmes défis qui reviennent, et peut-être que la solution n'est pas toujours la même, mais ce semble toujours le même défi, celui, comme vous en avez parlé plus tôt, uh, celui d'embrasser de, 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 l'autonomie des, 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 des provinces et la diversité, ou est-ce que, est que vous envoyez des nouveaux défis peut-être qui vont demander à la Fédération canadienne de s'adapter peut-être différemment? Oui, bien entendu, euh, vous avez mentionné euh, le dossier des changements climatiques à titre d'exemple, qui est un bel exemple euh, où, justement, il peut y avoir une meilleure collaboration fédérale-provinciale et il doit y avoir une meilleure collaboration fédérale-provinciale. Je pense également au dossier des armes à feu, dont on discute beaucoup euh, par les temps qui courent. Euh, il y a beaucoup de beaux dossiers. Le dossier des... En fait, le dossier autochtone est un dossier qui va occasionner littéralement une révolution du droit. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to uh, think uh, about Canada as being uh, uh, two official languages and uh, uh, a linguistic uh, duality and... Um, Uh, the, um, the, the Francophones, the Anglophones, and so on and so forth. But the, Aber the indigenous people are going to uh, provoke a real revolution of the way we see Canada. Uh, the dualistic view of Canada is, will have to be uh, uh, reviewed in the light of of the uh, emergence of the indigenous people in Canada. Il va y avoir une véritable révolution du droit à la lumière du dossier autochtone, j'en suis convaincu, et je dirais que c'est le plus gros défi auquel le Canada va devoir faire face. 
le plus gros défi, c'est vraiment de s'ajuster de de et de se réajuster en fonction de l'émergence euh, du dossier autochtone. Euh, mais vous savez, euh, je parlais il y a un instant de la collaboration fédérale-provinciale. Euh, eh bien, euh, quand nous avons formé le gouvernement, nous, euh, au Québec, euh, en 2003, euh, nous avons pris l'initiative de créer le Conseil de la Fédération. And one of the goals of the uh, Council of the Federation, uh, which exists since uh, 2003, one of the goals was, at the beginning, to uh, make sure that the provinces have a say with regards to the definition of tomorrow's Canada. Mm -hmm. It was not just, the, the goal was not just to strengthen the relationship between the provinces and the territories. It was also to make sure that the provinces be part of the great decisions that concern the future of Canada. So uh, it's related to what you just said, Charles, quand vous avez dit, bon, mais dans le fond, est-ce que euh, les provinces ne devraient pas être invitées à, ben enfin, vous avez dit, à redéfinir le, le, le Canada, à participer à la définition du Canada. Mais ben c'est justement ça. C'est l'un des défis du Canada aussi. L'un des défis du Canada, ça va être de, de s'assurer que les provinces participent davantage à la définition du Canada de demain. Uh, that's one of the challenges that uh, Canada has to face and that the federal government will have to face or hope will face in the future. Uh, I, I want to go back to something that Jenna said. At, 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 I can't remember if it was, I don't think it was in your presentation. It was later in, in, in an answer to a question where we were talking about, about the people as being also a safeguard. And, and um, I want to talk about that role a bit and, and the role of people in making a federalism robust and, and not politicians, but like actual Canadians and citizens. Uh, by definition, the central or the federal government is is further away from citizens. It's 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 in their everyday life. That's not necessarily what they see, right? The same way that their municipal governments is much more present in their everyday life than their provincial government. But how does a federation go about keeping those people committed to it, to 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 that federal government that they don't necessarily see in their everyday life, uh, uh, to that presence of a further away government? Basically, how do we keep people committed? to that government that may seem, uh, again, not always, but may seem uh, in, in everyday life as something that's that's somewhere over there and that you you, you don't necessarily. And there's an, 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 a part of that that's also just, that can feed into your identity and who you identify with and, and who you feel best represents your interests. Uh, there's an issue there for a federal government to make sure that people keep identifying or feeling that their interests are represented within the, 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 the federal government as well. Yeah, this is a, a, a very tricky question. Uh, tricky in a lot of ways. The um, because it, you know, in a federal system, we don't want just want people to identify with the federal government, but also, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, with the national government on its own. Like kind of in, in, in the way that Benoit was talking about with with um, the younger people just thinking, you know, I, I, thinking of Ottawa as being all there is. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the uh, uh you know what we used to have is a um civic education uh that happened in our public schools and that uh helped people to 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 develop a common understanding of our shared past and our common future uh for a lot of reasons that has been broken apart in the united states i'm not sure where that stands in Canada. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's actually, uh, uh, because I care so much and believe so much in um, the significance of democratic norms in sustaining our democracy. Um, and that norms are things that are built and reinforced person to person. I now, I mean, it's separate work and stuff that I'm early days on, but I'm trying to better understand how um, through local communities, we can build 
an inclusive federalism. Uh, so, you know, one of the one of the concerns is if you if you decentralize too much, then you create uh, like a fortress federalism. You create ability for people to band together, identify with one another, and against everybody else. And that's that competitive, or even worse, right? Um, a, a kind of um, dynamic that can be destructive or can cause us to miss opportunities. And so I'm trying to better understand how we might, instead of building this fortress federalism, build one that's porous, build a sense of local identity, but that recognizes our interdependence with others. Um, and uh, I guess all I can say is stay tuned. I mean, the first step for all of us in political science is recognizing this as being a need. <laughs> um, and then from there, we can move forward in, in, in trying to better understand what, how um, to build those values and those norms um, to, you know, for me as a very concerned American, to try to reconstruct um, uh, um, the, the bulwarks that support our democracy. Um, and and finally, before I move to questions, I just maybe maybe it's maybe it's a it's a curveball. I, I apologize, <laughs> apologize if it is. Uh, but uh, our audience here is the federal public service. So, what do you see as their role in making the Canadian Federation robust? And I and appreciating that a lot of like many of these of, of these people in the audience do completely different jobs within the public mm -hmm. service so we won't be able to speak to everyone's uh position but just in general uh how could we see um, um the federal public services role in making the canadian federation robust and again if you want some time to think about it i'll just answer one question that's coming from uh uh, uh the audience um uh Monsieur Petit, vous avez parlé des relations de nations avec les Autochtones. Uh, you did talk about uh, you did talk about indigenous people as, as one of the uh, maybe challenges is not the right term, but something that the Canadian Federation will have to come to terms with, uh, allowing indigenous governments to have their say and 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 play a role in the Canadian Federation. I have to say that we will have a whole session specifically about this during this series about indigenous people and how they interact with the with, with the federation. So I'll just uh, postpone answering that question. Well, well, we'll do it with people from indigenous communities uh, later on uh, in in the in the series. Um, so going back to you, if you have a, an answer to, to 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 that curveball I just threw you about, uh, maybe how people in the audience, uh, the public service in Canada, can can perhaps uh, make the or help make the uh, uh, not that not saying that it rests entirely on them, but how they can perhaps. Uh, 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 help in making the Kane Federation robust. And I'm assuming that uh, by you, you mean me because you pose the question in English and not in French. Uh, <laughs> 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 but um, with pleasure. So, uh, yeah. All right. So let's think about that. The, these two setting aside the federalism as a nuisance model and thinking about competitive federalism versus collaborative federalism and the role that. Um, uh, public servants, federal public servants can play in managing those two, or in particular, in when there are opportunities to move us from a competitive um, interaction to a collaborative one. Um, and so remember when I was talking about what we don't have in the United States, um, the, the institutions that sustain, uh, that support dialogue. Collaboration, in order to uh, come to believe that we share values and definitely to align our actions, you know, these two sides of what what makes something collaborative, um, takes a lot. Uh, it, it's a it's a process heavy um, uh, kind of relationship. Uh, um, Competition is really easy. Uh, Collaboration is not easy. It means taking the time to listen and taking the time to um, not just listen, but actually hear, right, <laughs> and incorporate. And uh, and so I think um, one of the best things, uh, it, it, and like I said, I, I feel like you already have some advantages in in having some institutions set up to create those dialogues, but to take them quite seriously and and have a mindset of 
this isn't, um, we don't necessarily always have to lock horns, but there may be opportunities for collaboration. So just pausing a moment, being patient and seeing if that opportunity can reveal itself and recognize that you have a really important role to play in making that process successful um, could go a long way in making, um, ensuring the robustness of Canadian federal system. So. Et Benoît, pour vous, quel rôle voyez-vous pour, pour la, la fonction publique fédérale dans, avoir, dans, dans la création de cette fédération canadienne robuste? Oui. Mais d'abord, je dois mentionner, Charles, que moi, j'ai commencé ma carrière comme avocat pour le ministère de la Justice du Canada. J'ai fait ça pendant sept ans. Donc, euh, j'ai pu m'initier à, 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 la, à la fonction publique fédérale. Et aujourd'hui, ben, c'est avec plaisir que je m'adresse à à vous tous et toutes, mais je pense vraiment qu'il euh, y, y a trois points. De, le premier point, euh, c'est qu'il faut s'interroger sur, euh, dans le fond, euh, euh, le fédéralisme coopératif. Et Jenna vient de mentionner le concept de « cooperative federalism », and this is also a concept that is uh, invoked Uh, on occasions by the Supreme Court of Canada. In fact, on many occasions, it's invoked by the Supreme Court of Canada, that need of cooperative federalism in Canada. Le deuxième, moi, je dirais, la deuxième chose que je, je, je recommande, c'est l'ouverture d'esprit. L'ouverture d'esprit, notamment, je viens notamment, par rapport aux Autochtones au Canada, par rapport à l'ensemble de la francophonie canadienne, parce que j'ai beaucoup parlé du Québec, mais moi, j'ai beaucoup à cœur aussi euh, l'ensemble de la francophonie canadienne, c'est-à-dire tous ces francophones et francophiles qui vivent en situation minoritaire et qui font également partie de la définition du Canada d'aujourd'hui. Et bien entendu, il y a les groupes minoritaires dans la société auxquels il faut porter attention avec leurs droits constitutionnels et tout simplement, je dirais, leur droit d'exister et le droit de s'épanouir dans la société canadienne. So, the, the first point would be cooperative federalism. The second point would be, um, it, uh, I would say, Um, the Canadian values, uh, uh, an examination or analysis of what forms the Canadian values today. And the third point is openness. Une ouverture d'esprit dans tous les dossiers ne peut qu'être profitable pour l'État canadien. Um, so, I, Jenna, Benoit, uh, merci beaucoup. Um, this has been a, a, a truly illuminating conversation, uh, one that I think really sets the stage for the rest of our series. And we, we saw some questions coming in that will be part of, of, the fut of, of the future of this series. Because before delving into questions about how resources are allocated across orders of government or our federalism helps or hinders economic development and questions like that, It was essential, I think, to have a better understanding of, of really like the theoretical underpinnings of federalism and what makes a federation uh, robust. And after recent events, whether it's the Quebec election from earlier this week or the Alberta UCP leadership results from last night, it is perhaps uh, uh, reassuring to know that the Canadian Federation and its uh, institutions have been able to adapt to challenges of the past, have the tools required to be, ro to be a robust federation, um, uh, capable of, of really facing the challenges ahead. Um, J'aimerais remercier nos panélistes et vous tous à travers le pays d'avoir participé à, à cet événement. J'espère que vous avez apprécié l'événement autant que moi. Um, your feedback is very important to us and I invite you to complete the electronic evaluation that you will receive in the next uh, few days. Uh, the school has more events to offer you and I encourage you to visit their website to keep up to date and register to, to all future learning opportunities, including this series, which will continue monthly uh, uh, this year and next. Once again, uh, thank you all and um, have a wonderful day. Au revoir.